Before we get started today, I know there was a question on yesterday's topic, so. Questions about trusts. If they die, testamentary trust. Trustee is the guy that runs it. A will provided the local banker take care of the deceased's estate until the descendant's children reach age of, what kind of trust is this? A trust deed is the deed that deeds the property into it. I believe the quiz may be wrong. Chapter number six on the chapter for those of you at home. I'm going to look into that and then see if that shouldn't be changed. Testamentary is when a trust is made based on a will after a person passes away. The word testate means dies with a will. Okay. All right. So <clears throat> number six says a will provided that the local banker take care of the deceased estate until the deceased's children reach age 25. What kind of trust is this? And the current answer as of this date says trust deed, and that's not correct. It is a testamentary trust. What a coincidence, told him too. <laughs> Yeah, so if you're listening to this, if you're listening to it, I may have already changed it by the time you listen to it, all right? That's for the people online, because that's, that's probably not right. And when I say probably, I mean it's not right. <laughs> but those are the kind of questions that are really good, because it made you read three or four more times and go through it, so I guarantee you'll never miss anything on a testamentary trust now, probably. A trustee, it's actually a deed of trust. It's the deed that transfers the property from the trustor into the trust, and we'll actually talk about it in the financing section. It's called a deed of trust. <clears throat> Maybe it should have said, which one of these is not a deed or not a trust type? So <clears throat> we'll get that changed and corrected, and it may already be corrected for those of you listening uh, by the time you get to this. All right, we're going to move on to the next chapter, Chapter 5. Chapter 5 is perhaps my favorite chapter in the entire book. When I started this course, I had been teaching for another school, and when we got to this section, we had this little bitty whiteboard. And it was always a big pain because I had to keep erasing it and showing it, and I always said that if I ever had my in school, I would make the board big enough that I could do this whole thing on the board. So you see before you 16 feet of whiteboard simply for this one chapter. And that's why I do, do this, because we will use this entire board. Uh, for those listening at home, there's a second additional video that I've done for you guys, uh, which mirrors what's going to happen today. All right? <clears throat> so chapter five is legal addresses. The worst way in the world to identify a property is by street address. Now. Nobody did it in this class, so I'm very proud of you because typically I get one person that does this at some point who will call me up and go, I'm at 432 South Emerson, where are you at? And I'll say, well, I'm standing right here. And then they'll go, okay, are you close to the railroad track? Now, I've never been to 432 South Emerson in Indianapolis, but there's a railroad track there because I get it all the time. So I asked them, I said, no, I'm in 432 South Emerson in Greenwood, Indiana. And they're like, oh, I'm in Indy. Okay, that's wrong. And then I really messed with them. I said, now, is that Greenwood, Indiana or Greenwood, Ohio? 
So the point I'm getting at is the street address is the worst way in the world to identify property. So we have come up with this legal description to identify property. We're going to talk about all three of the different methods to describe real estate. There are three of them. We're going to dis and talk about the process and how to measure the property above and below the surface. All right? So there's very little overheads in this chapter. There's a lot of boardroom in this chapter. I love this because it seems very logical to me. And if you get it, the light will click on and you will never miss another question. If you don't get it, you probably never will. And there are people that have done both. I had one girl say, how many questions? I oh, there's five or six. She goes, ask her. I'll just miss all those and get everything else right. Because she never, never could catch the concept, OK? So let's get started. There are three methods of creating a legal description. Um, a legal description is a document that is designed to describe the parcel of real estate. It is created through a survey. These are one of the people in the real estate world that we didn't talk about were surveyors. So this surveyor come in and he will create this legal document. All right. Now, when we first started, we had this really easy one. And the first one we're going to talk about is called meets and bounds. The meets and bounds. Meets and bounds is exactly what it sounds like. Meets means a distance. Bounds means a direction, OK? So it's very simple. You start out at some point, and that point is called the POB, which stands for point of beginning. They literally identify so many feet from here to there. That is the point of beginning. And then it literally describes the property. 200 feet east to some, the word you're looking for is monument. Now, this monument can be man-made or it can be naturally occurring, like the big oak tree. Typically, it's a man-made monument, like a stake driven into the ground. And occasionally, if you're out walking in the street or playing in the street or doing whatever, watch for cars. But the second thing you'll see is you might see the top of a st stake head in the middle of the street. That is a monument somewhere for something. That's what we're talking about. So on the meets and bounds, it literally says 200 feet east to some monument. Then 200 foot south to some monument. Then 200 feet west to some monument, followed by 200 feet north. Now, you have to, here's the key. On the meets and bounds, you have to end the description with the words and back to the point of beginning. That way, if there's some mismeasurement or something's off, at least it closes this loop. Because what you don't want is something that looks like this, where the ends don't touch. That will drive a title company crazy and stop a closing. So it would say 200 feet <coughs> east to some monument, 200 feet south to some monument, 200 feet west to some monument, 200 feet north, and back to the point of beginning. That way it closes that loop to create that legal description of that property. Now, the only good thing about this one, it has two other things that the others don't. The meets and bounds allows for angles and has this really cool mythical thing called eh, more or less, plus or minus, more or less. So what I want to do is on page 69 of your book, and let's flip to this real quick. 
right here on the video is a outline of a piece of property or the description. Let me read it to you and what I want you guys to do is follow along. A uh, tract of land located in Red Skull, Boone County, Virginia, described as the following. Beginning at the intersection of the east line of Jones Road and the south line of Skull Drive. That's our point of beginning. That's the POB. See the star? So it's telling you right where the POB is. It's at the corner of the east side of that road and the south side of that road. Then east along the south line of Skull Drive, 200 feet, south 15 degrees, there's the angle, for 216 and a half feet, more or less, to the center thread of the Red Skull Creek. All right, time out. So it's 216 and a half feet, more or less, to the center of the creek. Why more or less? The creek can move. Remember, we talked about this. You could have accretion on one side and erosion on the other, so you can get that creek that might fluctuate two or three feet or a foot either way. So what they're telling you is this property line is 216 and a half, more or less. One year, maybe it's 216.2. One year, maybe it's 216.8. But it's 216 and a half, more or less, to the center thread of the creek. All right, so what kind of rights is this guy going to have? What kind of water rights? You said that very quickly. Riparian. How do you know that? Because it's on a river. But what kind of river is this? It is a non-navigable river. And we know that because he owns to the center thread. So it's probably a creek or a stream or something of that nature. So he owns to the center thread of this stream. All right, so let's go back. Then northwesterly along the center line of said creek to the intersection of the east line of Jones Road, then north 105 feet more or less, once again that river right there or that creek right there could move a little bit, so it's 105 feet more or less, along the east line of Jones Road and back to the point of beginning. So what you see, if you look at that picture, is a rectangular with a point at the bottom kind of looking thing. I always thought it looked like Kentucky, but I'm not sure that's right. But what, you, what happens is it has described the boundaries of that, that parcel of land. That would be the owner's legal description that is all bounded by those distances and the creek on one side. That monument, remember I told you, can be naturally or man-made. In one case, it's a natural monument. They're using the center thread of the creek as the monument. Probably up near the road, there's spikes driven in the ground, and the surveyor would just find that spike and say, okay, here it is. Now I can measure the 15 degrees and go down to the center thread of the creek. So this is called the meets and bounds method. Very easy to use. Works very well. All right? So let's change the audio.